You ever hear the expression, we're all made of star stuff? You are stardust. It turns out that it's true, and that stuff is carbon. So in today's video, we're gonna talk all about carbon, which is chapter four in AP Biology. Hi guys, my name is Mikey from Avil Perk Academy, and in this series of videos, we try to cover one chapter from AP Biology in about 10 minutes, and today's focus is on chapter four, which is all about carbon. So why is carbon so important for biology? In order to explain this, we're gonna divide this video into three parts. The first part is going to focus on why carbon is so good at making large macromolecules. The second part is gonna focus a little bit more on the structure and function aspect of carbon-based molecules. And the third part is going to be about the dreaded functional groups that you guys all hate. But we're gonna to try to figure out why functional groups are important and also some easy ways to remember them as well. So let's get started right away. So number one, why is carbon so good at making large molecules? So carbon has an atomic number of six, which means it has six protons, and in its atomic state, it also has six electrons, two in its first orbital and four in its second orbital. Now, when you notice these four valence electrons in that second orbital, you'll notice that there's one up, down, left, and right, north, south, west, and east, or however you want to do that. The most important part is that this is the maximum number of valence electrons that you could have, each unpaired, ready to make covalent bonds. So if you're not familiar with the idea of covalent bonding, then I highly suggest that you brush up on your chemistry or watch another video that deals with covalent bonding. But the important thing is that each one of these electrons can be used in a single covalent bond with another molecule. And what that means is carbons can become really, really really, really, really long, and carbons can also branch, carbons can form rings, and carbon can also form double or even triple bonds, which then can alter the shape of that carbon molecule. Now, of course, that structural flexibility is incredibly important for creating biological molecules. And there we get to the second part of this video. In biology, form and function are inseparable. And it turns out that when you take a look at a carbon-based molecule, like for example, butane, C4H10, well, there's this butane and there's this butane. Now, of course, the second butane is called isobutane, but what you'll notice is that the chemical formula for both of these molecules are identical. But it turns out that because they're shaped differently, we actually see them behaving differently, not only in chemistry, but of course in biology as well. And as such, we need to study a little bit about how different structures can manifest in carbon-based molecules. So here we learn about isomers. You see, the example that I just gave you with butane and isobutane are isomers of each other because they share the same chemical formula, but they have different structures. Now, let's take a look at another example of a very specific type of isomer, which are called enantiomers. Enantiomers are essentially molecules that look very similar, but are mirror images of one another. So for instance, you can take a look at your right hand and you can take a look at your left hand. And what you'll notice is that you'll never be able to superimpose them on top of each other. And just like that, enantiomers are molecules that are mirror images of one another. And AP Biology really likes this idea because when you look at the pharmaceutical applications of enantiomers, you'll notice that we have things like ibuprofen or albuterol, which work in one or the other size with the other half not working at all. If you were to think about why this is important, it all comes down to form and function. You can think about these molecules as keys unlocking a lock, the lock being a receptor on one of our cells. So you could imagine that if you took a key and you made a copy of it, but a mirror image of it, it will never open the lock that the original key was intended to open. As such, the lack of structural matching between the wrong enantiomer and the receptors will result in essentially a non-functional chemical. And the last part of this video is going to be focused on functional groups. Now, I know that functional groups can be daunting, especially if you haven't studied chemistry or organic chemistry, but I wanted to devote most of this video's time onto these functional groups because they're going to pay dividends as you move on to chapter five and beyond even into chapter 18 and 19. So let's just take a moment to talk about why functional groups are important. You see, up to this point in chapter four, we've been mostly talking about alkanes. Now, what are alkanes? Alkanes are simple hydrocarbons that have single bonds. So for example, methane, ethane, propane, butane, pentane, and all of these different molecules that you see on the screen right now 
are simple alkanes. But the thing is, these alkanes are really boring and boring for a different reason than what you might be thinking right now. You see, the thing is, in biology, all of these chemical reactions that we care about happens within an aqueous environment. However, when you take a look at these alkanes, you'll notice that they are nonpolar and that makes them non-water soluble or otherwise known as hydro phobic, which means that none of these molecules that we've talked about thus far dissolve in water. So then why are we learning about it? Well, when we couple these alkanes with these functional groups, then it starts to make a lot more sense. You guys ever play video games where you're at a character selection screen and the character is sort of dancing around and you get to sort of equip that character with different equipment in order to give that character additional properties? Well, that's kind of like how these functional groups can act in biology. So let's take a look at this ethane molecule, for example. You'll notice that this ethane molecule has six hydrogens, but if I were to take just one of those hydrogens and replace it with a functional group like a hydroxyl group, the OH, and now with that hydroxyl group being polar, can provide ethanol with polarity. And what that means is now ethanol is dissolvable in water which should make it more interesting for biology. Now we're gonna run through a list of these functional groups and what I wanna do is to sort of give you guys justifications for why they're important. So let's go back to that hydroxyl group for one minute. Hydroxyl group is OH. The name is sort of obvious, hydroxyl, hydrogen, oxygen, hydroxyl group. So why is hydroxyl group so important? Hydroxyl groups can make molecules polar. Now in its application, we're gonna preview chapter five and take a look at these monosaccharides. Now these are sugars, and as you know, sugars dissolve in water. And if you take a look at all of these monosaccharides, whether it be glyceraldehyde, glucose, fructose, or galactose, they are all loaded to the T with these hydroxyl groups, making them very water soluble, pretty important. Okay, now the second group is the carbono group, which is essentially a double bonded oxygen attached to one of the carbons. Now there is a bit of nuance about whether carbono groups are at the end or in the middle, but ultimately that kind of detail isn't going to be as important as knowing once again where these are gonna be found. And again, we're gonna be looking at those sugars. Take a look at these carbono groups in each one of these sugar molecules. We have the ones at the end, which are called aldoses, and we have these carbono groups in the middle, which are called ketoses. And I know I just told you that that's not important, but that's sort of where the naming convention comes from, and you can definitely read about that in your textbook. So how do you remember carbono group? Well, think about it, carbo, O, O. That O sound that you get is that double bonded oxygen to the carbon. So the third group is the carboxyl group, and the carboxyl group is a portmanteau. What does that mean? That means two words that have been shoved into one, the carboxyl coming from carbonyl and hydroxyl, sandwiched into carboxyl, and the structure is also a sandwich. But you'll notice a carbon attached to an oxygen through a double bond like the carbonyl group, but also a hydroxide group like the hydroxyl group. So just as the name is sandwiched into one, so is the structure. So if you know your hydroxyl and you know your carbonyl, you're gonna be just fine. So where do we find this? Well, let's just wait on that for a second because we're gonna talk about the next functional group and we're gonna introduce them together in its application to the next chapter. So the next group is the amino group, the NH2. Now, the way to memorize the amino group is to think about the N sound that you're getting, amino, and that N sound is really referring to that nitrogen, which is sort of unique in terms of the functional group structures. So as I promised, why are amino groups and carboxyl groups important? Well, let's just take a look at what we call an amino acid. An amino acid is a monomer of polypeptides and proteins that we're gonna see in the next chapter. And you'll notice that on any given amino acid, you have an amino group and the carboxyl group attached to that central carbon. So that is going to be important later on. Now the next group is called a sulfhydro group, which as the name suggests, includes sulfur and hydrogen. Now this one has a very specific reason as to why it appears here, and it has to do with a very specific amino acid that we call cysteine. So I'm gonna put up a picture of cysteine, but you're gonna really appreciate this in the next chapter where we talk about different levels of protein structure. So for now, just know that sulfhydro groups is going to come out again in your study of amino acids. 
Now the next group is going to be the phosphate group. Now this one is quite important. You see, in studying chemistry, we typically learn phosphate groups as being a three minus polyatomic ion. But in biology, we rarely see them as three minus. And the reason is that in biology, these phosphate groups are associated with biological molecules, utilizing some of those loose electrons into forming covalent bonds. So unlike chemistry, where we think about phosphates as a minus three, in biology, we think about them as two minus or minus but they are going to be charged nonetheless, which by the way, as a hint, that's going to make this phosphate very water soluble. Now where we see phosphate in biology is actually twofold. In chapter five, we're going to learn about something called phospholipids, which are these molecules that form our cell membranes. And we also see phosphates in forming the backbone of DNA and RNA in the nucleic acid section. Now just keep in mind what I said about water solubility and that negative charge, because that's going to come out again and again and again, even in molecular biology. Now the last group is the methyl group. Now this is probably the least important group for us as AP biology people, but just keep in mind that methane was CH4, methyl group is simply the CH3 component that we're able to place onto other biological substances. Now in the textbook, they will tell you that methyl groups are used to deactivate or to create inertness within biological substances. Now this is a completely different topic that we talk about in things like gene regulation and gene expression regulation, which is covered, but in the eukaryotic sense, not as well developed within the AP biology curriculum. So if you're interested in that, I would suggest you guys read the relevant chapters, which I believe is like chapter 21. But if I'm wrong, I'll put it in the text below. So that's it. Chapter four is all about carbon and why carbon is important for biology. And we just about covered everything that you need to know. So if you guys have any questions, please leave them in the comment below. If you enjoy this content, press the like button and click subscribe so you don't miss out where we move on to chapter five macromolecules. And I'll try to do that in 10 minutes. We'll see how it goes. We'll see you guys later. Have a great day.